Disclaimer! This video contains spoilers for Batman Begins. We all good on that? Excellent. Time to become a legend. The year is 1997, and Batman's gone through one hell of a roller coaster on the big screen. Things got off to a great start with Tim Burton's Batman, raking in hundreds of millions of dollars and introducing a whole new generation to the caped crusader and his most iconic arch nemesis, the Joker. And because of its success, plenty of the creative team returned in 1992 for Batman Returns, the immensely horny and therefore more controversial entry. While still receiving critical praise, it didn't quite hit the same chord with some kids, and especially their parents. So when the time came for a third movie, the franchise took on a massive course correction to lighten things up with 1995's Batman Forever. This time directed by Joel Schumacher, and this time going far far more garish, goofy, and over the top in order to sell Batman with as many Happy Meals as possible. And all of that was dialed up to 11 with 1997's Batman and Robin. Seven million. Never leave the cave without it. I mean, why not, right? After Batman Forever was a massive success, why not continue going down that road? Well, despite Warner Brothers going all in on Schumacher's vision for Batman, things wound up exploding in their face with Batman and Robin. While the movie raked in a considerable $42 million over its opening weekend, it quickly stumbled after that, ultimately tapping out with $107 million domestically and $238 million worldwide, being the lowest grossing of all all four movies. Not only that, but the film was a critical failure. Fans and critics laid into it hard, and it quickly became the punching bag of the summer. Despite Warner Brothers' plans to move forward with a fifth movie, which was going to dial up the silliness even further, the negative financial and critical reception to Batman and Robin stalled the whole franchise right in its tracks. But it's not like Warner Brothers could simply abandon this character. Batman had been a mainstay in pop culture for decades, so the question began to be raised. Where does Batman go from here? At first, there were plans to continue the series with the fifth film, with Joel Schumacher even adjusting his plans to instead go a bit darker, to do something more akin to the two Tim Burton movies, but the studio would eventually abandon this idea. They'd instead pursue an idea by Stephen Wise and comic book fan Lee Shapiro to adapt The Dark Knight Returns, featuring a later in years Batman who was returning to Gotham to fight crime once again. But despite the pieces beginning to move on that project, by the time the clock had turned to the 21st century, it too was abandoned, as was the idea to continue from the previous four movies altogether. Instead, Warner Brothers began to consider the idea of restarting Batman entirely. This was practically unheard of at the time. Warner Brothers was thinking of taking four movies that lots of people had seen that had been worldwide hits, and they were going to pretend they didn't exist and completely start over. They wanted to reboot Batman, and they searched far and wide for creators who would take the character in a new direction. One of the more wild attempts came in conjunction with Warner Brothers also trying to revive Superman on the big screen. Screenwriter Andrew Kevin Walker proposed the idea of creating a Batman vs. Superman movie. DC Comics' two biggest characters were going to go head to head, and developments were continuing for years after this first pitch was made. But ultimately, after many criticisms were levied at the concept, Warner Brothers resorted back to tackling Superman and Batman in their own individual projects. Two ideas came to the forefront after this. One was an idea to adapt Batman Beyond, still going in the route of a later in years Batman fighting crime, but that was ultimately sidelined for the idea that the studio found way more interesting. Adapting Batman Year One. Instead of following the later years of Batman, Warner Brothers wanted to tackle the earliest days of the Cape Crusader. They wanted to tell something of an origin story. In the beginning, Darren Aronofsky was attached to direct and co-write the screenplay with Frank Miller, who originally wrote the Batman Year One comic. Eventually, even Joss Whedon provided a pitch for his own idea for a Batman solo film, but both of these were ultimately abandoned by December 2002. Despite five years of attempts to revive Batman on the big screen, Warner Brothers was hitting dead end after dead end, with no real central aim to get a project off the ground and into movie theaters. But eventually,
eventually the tide would begin to shift, as Warner Brothers Soul Searching would lead them to one unexpected filmmaker in January of 2003. And this filmmaker was none other than Christopher Nolan. With only three feature films under his belt, Christopher Nolan wasn't the most well-known name in the industry, but all three of his films managed to speak for themselves. From the indie noir following to the memory and time-bending thriller Memento, and his first ever studio film Insomnia, it was clear that there was a real voice behind each of these projects. A voice that would take Batman in a direction he had never gone before. And fans became immediately excited on January 27th when the news was made official. Christopher Nolan had just been attached to the next Batman film to reinvent the character and breathe new life into the franchise. This is where it all began. This is where a character that was presumed dead on the big screen would once again return to become a box office powerhouse. From birth to death, from fall to rise, this is a complete retrospective on the Dark Knight trilogy. If you're enjoying the video so far, subscribe to the channel. It helps out a lot. Alright, let's keep it moving. With Christopher Nolan on board as a director, the pieces on a fifth live-action Batman movie were now finally underway. But Christopher Nolan alone couldn't make this entire movie. In fact, right off the bat, he made the call to pair himself with another screenwriter to bring this story to fruition. I've always been a big fan of the character, but I am by no means any kind of comic book expert. I felt I needed a writer on the project who really knew the character inside out, really knew the comic world. Which is where David S. Goyer became involved. Previously penning the scripts for the Blade movies, his knowledge and experience in the comic book world was instrumental to getting this version of Batman off the ground. And together, both he and Christopher Nolan would begin to create their quintessential Batman story. Most specifically, telling an origin story for the character. While there were hints of an origin story in the previous movies, with a handful of flashbacks to the murder of Bruce Wayne's parents, this would be the first time that Bruce Wayne's entire journey to become the Caped Crusader would be covered on the big screen. Which also meant the movie was going to cast a bit younger for the title role, which led to the most daunting prospect in the early days of development. Who was going to play Batman? Across the summer of 2003, pretty much every available actor was approached to see if they would be right to take on the cape and cowl. Rumors immediately swirled that Guy Pearce, who of course starred in Memento, would take on the title character. But eventually, the pool of actors grew exponentially. Tons of names were thrown around, from Jake Gyllenhaal to Eon Bailey, Joshua Jackson, Henry Cavill, Killian Murphy, and Christian Bale. Plenty of these actors screen-tested for the role, tackling both sides of the character, testing as as Bruce Wayne in a more party-like setting, and of course, testing as Batman, using the Batman Forever costume to get into the role. And ultimately, through this multi-month process of searching and scouring for every available actor they could find, the pool was finally narrowed down to none other than... Christian Bale. In September of 2003, it was finally confirmed that Christian Bale would take on Bruce Wayne, being the first British actor to take on the character as well. And having starred in movies like American Psycho and Reign of Fire, there was quite a bit of confidence in Christian Bale's ability to show off both the dark and light sides of the Batman character. The question subsequently became, who was going to star alongside him? Well, in trying to follow in the footsteps of 1978's Superman, Christopher Nolan wanted to fill the supporting roles with tons and tons of fantastic and recognizable actors to help fill out his version of this world. Superman had the likes of Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman, and this iteration of Batman was going to follow suit. First up, Michael Caine joined the cast as Alfred, promising that the character would get more development than had in any of the previous movies. Further players began to join, like Katie Holmes as the reported love interest, and eventually Killian Murphy was cast as one of the villains. Killian Murphy of course screen tested for the title character, and while both he and Christopher Nolan agreed that he wasn't right for that part, the creatives behind the scenes liked the test a lot, and figured that there might be a better place to utilize that talent. And while it wasn't confirmed to audiences just yet, Killian Murphy was going to take on the first big screen iteration of the Scarecrow. Following this, the cast began to explode in the early months of 2004. 
With such heavy hitters as Morgan Freeman as Lucius Fox, Ken Watanabe as the villain Ray Shal Ghoul, Liam Neeson as Henry Ducard, and eventually Gary Oldman joined the cast as none other than Jim Gordon, which wasn't initially what he was approached for. Christopher Nolan initially talked to Gary Oldman to take on the part of the villain, but after playing villains in plenty of other movies, Gary Oldman wanted to do something different. And so, after some contemplating, the role of Jim Gordon eventually came his way and he signed on. All of this led to the start of production in March 2004. Things got on a roll in a location that had never been seen in a Batman movie before, Iceland. After four movies pretty much exclusively in Gotham, the first weeks of Nolan's Batman showed fans that this movie was most definitely going in a new direction by exploring a world outside of Gotham. But the start of production wasn't the only exciting news for fans, as it also marked the official reveal of the film's title. For months now, the internet and message boards had speculated that the title would be Batman Intimidation Game, or simply Batman Intimidation, which wound up only being the working title to conceal the real name of the movie. But now, fans knew the real deal. The movie was simply going to be called none other than Batman Begins. Not only did it follow in the footsteps of the previous Batman titles, but it also confirmed to fans that this would tell Batman's origin story. This would be the dawn of the Caped Crusader, and eyes were now trained onto the production to gain any insights they could on this all-new take on Batman. Following the brief stint in Iceland, the production took a turn to England, with plenty of filming done in London, as well as the Mentmore Towers for the exteriors of Wayne Manor. The film also spent a lot of time inside of an airship hangar in Cardington, where they'd build massive sets for the Bat Cave and even a massive street of Gotham, dressing it with immense detail, all of which served to bring this world to life in ways that had never been done before. But also, with the advent of filming plenty of interior shots and being locked in a massive hangar, not a lot of the film's imagery got out to audiences, which was entirely by design. Christopher Nolan likes to keep as much a secret as possible, even if it's just revealing certain nondescript scenes that don't reveal much to do with the story. All because movies are essentially magic, and he doesn't want to spoil that by revealing too much of how the trick was pulled off. But fans did get some glimpses of the new designs and new iconography during production. For one thing, Entertainment Weekly provided the very first look at the all-new Batsuit, revealing an all-black, almost silhouette-like form. And of course, during some exterior shots in England, and especially when the production made a sizable turn to Chicago, fans got their first looks at the all-new Batman. Mobile, this massive tank of a vehicle, which was seen being chased by Gotham police cars through the streets of Chicago. It was certainly a different look for the Batmobile. Gone was the overly stylized and flashy cars of Batman Forever and especially Batman and Robin. This was a machine built purely for its function. But it wasn't originally going to be part of this new movie's story. Early in the process, in trying to create a more realistic version of Batman, the Batmobile wasn't something that was going to fit into that whole mold. But Christopher Nolan asked the executives and people in charge at Warner Brothers what they would want in this new movie, and they said while they wouldn't put Push it, it would be a letdown in some ways if the Batmobile never made an appearance. It was clear that just emotionally, you know, it wasn't going to be Batman for them without the Batmobile. They weren't saying they needed to sell a bunch of toys or anything. It was just kind of like, it's going to be disappointing without it. And I thought, okay. The design of this new Batmobile came from Christopher Nolan describing it as a mash between a Humvee and a Lamborghini. Production designer Nathan Crowley took that inspiration literally. He grabbed a model kit of a Humvee and a model kit of a Lamborghini and smashed them together to create this rough shape for this new vehicle. And after some fine tuning and finessing to perfect the look, the all new Batmobile took shape. And ultimately, once it came same time to film, a full-size version was made to rush around the streets of Gotham in these massive set pieces. But all of these set photos and glimpses were merely a taste, because soon Warner Brothers would release something much bigger to get fans excited. Even though the movie was still one year out from release, Warner Brothers decided on July 28, 2004 to release the very first trailer for Batman Begins. They told me there was nothing out there. Nothing to fear. But the night my parents were murdered, I caught a glimpse of something. I've looked for it ever since.
across 70 seconds. This is a teaser in every sense of the word. Hell, if you had seen this in theaters, you likely wouldn't know what it was for most of its runtime. There's a sense of mystery, a sense of foreboding terror. It's much darker, much more grim than especially the last two Batman movies. And with narration from Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne, it tells the story of how he discovered something out in the darkness. Something mysterious. Something terrifying. Something that will not stop until it gets revenge. Me. Right at the very end, audiences caught a mere glimpse of the Cape Crusader himself. After 60 seconds of teasing, this was the reveal that Batman was coming back to the big screen. While still a year away, fans became excited for this return to form, and it also told general audiences that this was going to be something different than what they'd seen before. In a world where rebooting a franchise was almost unheard of, this small teaser let the world know that Batman was going to get a fresh start, and a start that would hopefully get as many fans into the movie theater as possible. Ultimately, in September of 2004, production on Batman Begins drew to a close. But despite the consistent influx of set images coming to an end, Warner Brothers still kept anticipation up with new images and new pieces of information to keep fans excited. Not only were there some official images released of some of the supporting cast, but it was also confirmed that Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard would collaborate for the film's score. The two had wanted to pair up for some time, and now they're was finally going to come true to create an all-new musical feel for Batman. But promotion really got off the ground in December of 2004. With only six months left until release, Warner Brothers worked hard to get the word out on this movie, and attempt to get rid of the everlasting stink of Batman and Robin. Firstly, they released the very first teaser poster, showing off this grim, silhouetted Batman, which was immediately followed up by an all-new teaser trailer. You travel the world. Now you must journey inwards. What you really fear is inside you. Across another 70 seconds, this trailer opens up more on the details of how Bruce Wayne becomes Batman, teasing his training with Henry Ducard and the League of Shadows, as well as the discovery of the Batcave, the creation of the costume, the Batarangs, and closing it all out with a massive montage of quick action shots to show off the all-new vibe this movie is going for. Where are you? If there was one takeaway from this trailer, it's that Batman was going to be scary. Things were going to be more intense than they had been in any of the previous movies. And as such, anticipation began to grow as the clock eventually turned to the year. As 2005 got started, the promotional cycle for Batman Begins hit full stride. Not only were there a series of promotional images released in January, but Warner Brothers made waves at the Super Bowl with an all-new 30-second TV spot, featuring more brief glimpses to the creation of Batman as well as some more action shots. But more specifically, this spot features the first official look at Scarecrow, and of course, it features the first tease to the new Batmobile. So what do you think? Does it come in black? And in the following weeks, new posters hit the internet, featuring more of this gothic new tone, as well as especially highlighting a sepia tone look as Batman is continuously silhouetted against an orange-hued sky. Following that, with further promotion, everything wound up building to the release of an all-new theatrical trailer at the end of April. After two minute-long teasers showed mere glimpses of this new take, this trailer finally opened the floodgates and gave audiences a definitive taste of what Christopher Nolan and this entire entire crew had cooked up. Tell us, Mr. Wayne. What do you fear? Across two minutes, this trailer packs a punch, revealing more of how Bruce Wayne created the Batman, his training with the League of Shadows, but even bigger than that, it shows off plenty of the supporting cast in their best looks yet. There are glimpses of Scarecrow, Ra's al Ghul, Lucius Fox, and even the movie's brand new original character Rachel Dawes, played by Katie Holmes. Coupled with big shots of action and spectacle, as well as the first taste of the score composed by Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard, this trailer got 
got fans excited. The tone of the Schumacher films was out the window. The bat nipples especially were out the window. Batman Begins was going to ground the franchise in a way none of the other movies had before. And with excitement building after this trailer, Warner Brothers even pushed forward the release date by two days. Originally set for June 17th, the movie was now going to hit theaters on June 15th, allowing audiences to experience this all-new Batman just that much sooner. From here, the promotional cycle went full blast, with new posters, images, interviews, as well as a slew of TV spots released in the weeks before release. Featuring more glimpses of Batman, the villains, the supporting cast, some tiny glimpses at some of the humor, and even a couple clever taglines. Fear ends. Justice prevails. Batman begins. And let's not overlook the fact that one of these TV spots featured the song Someday by Nickelback. Audiences were even able to engage with Batman in different mediums, as fans could take on the Caped Crusader themselves in the Batman Begins tie-in game for the PS2 and Xbox. Telling an approximation of the film's story and allowing fans to fight crime just in time for the Caped Crusader's return to the big screen. All of which built and built to the summer movie season. And while 2005 wasn't hitting the same box office numbers as 2004, there were still heavy hitters for Batman to contend with. Namely, the conclusion to the Star Wars saga in Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. But Batman is still one of the most popular and prolific characters in all of fiction. And despite the rocky road he's been on, there was still plenty of anticipation for this complete reboot of the character. And eventually, the time finally arrived. After eight years away, after one of the most critically reviled pieces of Batman media nearly killed the character on the big screen, Batman was back in theaters. Christopher Nolan, Christian Bale, and the entire team behind the movie had worked tirelessly to create a new version of the character that would stand apart from anything that had been done before. The pressure was on, and fans could only ask themselves one question. Would the movie be any good? Thankfully for them, early reviews were absolutely stellar. Critics were heaping praise all over the movie. If these reviews were to be believed, Batman was finally back, and it was now time for audiences to experience his return for themselves, as the clock had finally turned to June 15th, 2005. It was now time to roll up to movie theaters, grab some popcorn, and re-enter the city of Gotham once again. This is Bruce Wayne's story. Now that might sound a little obvious, but it's actually one of the defining differences between this movie and its predecessors. Every Batman adventure on the big screen up to this point had been significantly more interested in their respective villains. From the Joker to the Penguin to Catwoman, hell, Arnold Schwarzenegger got top billing in Batman and Robin. But this movie is 100% Bruce Wayne's. It follows him on both a physical and psychological journey. Starting as a man who's still weighed down by the grief and trauma of his childhood, and it sees him undergo a journey to use that to fuel something bigger than himself. And it's a journey that is greatly entertaining at every turn. It's thrilling, it's exciting, the performances are fantastic the whole way through, and from the very first minutes of the movie, the tone is established really, really well. In fact, the entire movie is built off of its tone. It's more somber and more methodical, but there's still a dry wit that maintains a sense of humor. All of this sets us off on a journey that can very easily easily be divided into four distinct chunks, or more accurately, four acts, starting with Act 1, The Beginning. While Bruce Wayne interacts and engages with plenty of characters across this movie's runtime, each act will see him paired up or more often going against one character in particular. Firstly, he's paired with his mentor, Henry Ducard, who inducts him into the League of Shadows, an organization run by none other than Ra's al Ghul, or as it's pronounced in this movie, Ra's al Ghul, all to train Bruce Wayne to fight in extraordinary ways and allow him to finally get a grasp on his own grief and most importantly, his own fear. Not only does this give us a great training montage featuring insights into how ninjas operate in the shadows, a sword fight on a glacier, but it also features this line. Rub your chest. 
The arms will take care of themselves. Which is said with such earnestness that you totally believe that that is a real thing. That your arms can take care of themselves if you get really cold. But the truth is, and Christopher Nolan himself has readily admitted this, it's a bunch of nonsense. It's just not true at all. He just presents that as a very convincing little bit of information that if anyone's watching this and goes camping, you know, it's based on nonsense. But this is only half of this first act, because this act tells its story out of order, cutting between Bruce's training in the present and his past in Gotham that ultimately led him here. Starting with his story as a boy, how he fell into a well and was traumatized by bats. And why do we fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves up. But it also features perhaps the most instrumental moment in Bruce Wayne's entire life, the murder of his parents. A theatrical production featuring bats, a scared kid wanting to leave, leading to a random mugging gone horribly wrong. All pieces to create a truly harrowing event. But it was also created by the systemic problems within Gotham City. Problems that the Waynes were trying to help fix, but that ultimately led to their demise. All of this is highlighted quite a bit when the movie flashes to about 10 years later, and Joe Chill, the murderer of Thomas and Martha Wayne, is given the deal for early parole, leading to one of my favorite shots in the whole movie. A shot that's relatively understated but holds a crazy amount of weight to it. Because who was attending this hearing but none other than Bruce Wayne? And at a certain point, his presence is made known to everyone in the room. I gather there is a member of the Wayne family here today. Has he got anything to say? At this point, Bruce stands up and leaves the courtroom. But we don't focus on him or his reaction to this. He remains out of focus in the background as Joe Chill remains crystal clear in the foreground. Not only are we able to understand Bruce's pain, but shooting it like this allows us to also see Joe Chill's reaction. Because with just a simple look, you can understand that he is now thinking about that scared little boy in that alleyway. And that scared boy is in the room with him right now. It's just a really effective shot and a really effective way to do multiple things at once in the span of only a few seconds. Now, ultimately, this act comes to a climactic head once Bruce Wayne's training is complete. He has learned to fight among the League of Shadows, he's tackled his own grief, even his own fear, and has now been given one final test. He must take a sword and take the life of a murderer. Pop quiz. What is Batman's one singular rule in most Batman stories? That's right, he will not kill. And right here, that mantra is brought to the forefront as Bruce Wayne is put to the test in more ways than one. And while it looks like he might break that internal rule of his, it's all ultimately a ruse, using his position to light the place on fire. Leading to pretty much the first major action sequence, showing off Bruce's new skills as the entire place explodes in a fiery inferno. Collapsing debris even kills Ra's al Ghul. Huh. I wonder if that counts as indirect murder. Regardless, it leaves Wayne and Ducard as two of the only survivors. Combine it all with impressive practical effects, miniatures, and you got yourself an exciting set piece with tons of great imagery and moments. I mean, that final explosion is pretty sick, I'm not gonna lie. But ultimately, with Ducard's life saved, Bruce Wayne decides the time has come to end his self-imposed exile from Gotham, leading us directly into Act 2, The Creation. As a man, I'm flesh and blood, I can be ignored, I can be destroyed, but as a symbol, as a symbol, I can be incorruptible, I can be everlasting. Upon returning to Gotham, Bruce Wayne has now found himself pursuing an all-new purpose. To shake Gotham out of its apathy by creating a dramatic example of good. All the while striking fear into the hearts of those who would prey on the fearful. It's through this notion that he decides to become something different. Something more than just a man. As Ducard put it earlier, he wishes to become... A legend. Which brings us to the most fun section of the movie, where Bruce Wayne slowly but surely creates... Batman. And it's all approached in such a way that feels credible and feels like it could happen in New York or Chicago tomorrow. Even the tomorrow of 2005. The thing is, Bruce Wayne actually has the wealth and infrastructure to pull something like this off. Wayne Enterprises has recently gone into contracts with the military, and they have plenty of rejected projects that Wayne now has full access to. You have a full-body, bulletproof Kevlar suit, a utility harness, a grapple gun, all sorts of crazy toys that Wayne can use to his heart's content. 
and all of this gear is introduced to us via Lucius Fox, played by the ever-excellent Morgan Freeman. Not only is he an expert in all of this technology, introducing it to both Bruce and the audience in a succinct way, but he also brings plenty of humor to the proceeding, as this movie is filled with dry wit around plenty of corners, and Lucius is one of the most significant characters in charge of delivering it. The way I see it, all this stuff is yours anyway. The other character delivering a lot of the movie's dry wit is none other than Michael Caine's Alfred, who not only gets to become far more of a parental figure for Bruce Wayne, with plenty of great exchanges between the two. Haven't given up on me yet. Never. But he also gets some of the movie's best lines. I assumed as you're taking on the underworld, this symbol is a persona to protect those you care about from reprisals. You're thinking about Rachel? Actually, sir. I was thinking to myself. And all of these pieces come together to create this vigilante persona. But it's not an instant creation. It's not just a matter of getting a bunch of equipment and then boom, there's Batman. It's a 20 minute section of the movie that features a lot of trial and error. Bruce obviously wants to keep his identity hidden and his body safe, so the mask and bodysuit make a lot of sense, but when it comes to fast escapes, jumping across rooftops isn't so easy for just a regular guy. So in comes Memory Cloth, which has the ability to take on a rigid shape when powered by some kind of electrical current. That'll allow Bruce to glide around the city and traverse through the skies. And in the event he wants to rush around across the ground there's nothing better than the Tumbler, a massive tank that can crush cars and even boost itself into a rampless jump. But perhaps most importantly of all is the symbol that Bruce ultimately lands on, bats. Bats are obviously a big source of fear for Bruce himself, having caused him trauma as a kid. But upon discovering that a cave of bats exists beneath Wayne Manor, he finally confronts that fear head on, resulting in this extremely powerful image of Bruce Wayne standing amidst the bats, gaining control of his fear. It's also the first time that the true motif of the Batman theme plays in the movie. Two simple notes, but given enough punch that they carry just an insane amount of power. With all of this combined, including a specialized cowl, forged batarangs, or more accurately, bat throwing stars, Bruce Wayne finally creates his symbol, his legend. But who is he going to aim it against? Well, none other than the second act's main antagonist, Carmine Falcone. Or as this movie pronounces it, Falcone. Falcone pretty much controls Gotham. He has judges under his thumb, union officials, councilmen, and pretty much the entire police force is corrupt and under his rule. A rule of, you guessed it, fear. In fact, pretty much the only cop not under the thumb of Falcone is Sergeant Jim Gordon, who pretty early on is brought into the Batman's fold, even when Bruce is still in the midst of creating this alter ego. You're just one man. But with nearly complete control over Gotham, Falcone is a prime target for Batman's first mission, leading to the night of his grand debut. Gotham has functioned one way for years, and now things are about to change forever. And it's a sequence that pays homage in a lot of ways to Jaws. Because one of the greatest aspects of that movie is that you don't see the shark all that much. There are glimpses and moments here and there, but it's significantly scarier because you rarely ever see it in full. And Christopher Nolan took that approach to the introduction of Batman. After an hour of runtime, this character has finally been created, with the entire goal to instill fear in the criminals. And that comes in a big way because none of them really get a good look at him. Batman is a creature, a monster who swoops down from above and tackles criminals without giving them a second to think. He's obscured, he's hidden in the shadows, and in this effort, the criminals immediately begin to run scared. And slowly but surely, all of Falcone's muscle in this scene is taken out, leading to the big reveal. I'm Batman. If that isn't cool enough, Falcone is later found strung up on a giant floodlight with outspread arms and torn up clothes, ultimately creating the bat signal. Batman has arrived, and even in this one single act, he's changed Gotham for good, which leads us nice and simply into Act 3, The Fear.
One of the most fun aspects of Batman as a character is not just him running around with cool gadgets and taking down bad guys, it's the secret identity of it all. Secret identities are hallmarks of pretty much every superhero story, and Batman is perhaps one of the most famous in this regard, and this movie utilizes that in a fun way to show that not only does Bruce Wayne create this fantastical image, but he also makes sure that no one would ever think to tie him to it. This ultimately creates three sides to Bruce Wayne. There's the real Bruce Wayne, who only certain people know, like Alfred and Lucius Fox. Then, of course, there's Batman, who some could argue is actually the real Bruce Wayne. And finally, there's the version of Bruce Wayne that everyone else sees. This vain, aloof billionaire who has absolutely no moral compass whatsoever, so no one would ever think to peg him as the guy going around taking down criminals. Well, the guy dresses up like a bat clearly has issues. <laughs> of course, Rachel Dawes sees through this charade. She knows him better than most, and despite their years of separation, it's clear that there are still some residual feelings between the two of them. But it's not who you are underneath. It's what you do that defines you. The music is also reflective of all of these sides of Bruce Wayne. With the score under the helm of two people, Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard, they both took on the duties of creating two distinct sounds that had mixed together in the final movie. James Newton Howard would take on the more emotionally focused aspects of the score, the slower, more character-driven musical moments, which is a reflection on Bruce Wayne, and Hans Zimmer took on the brunt of the action score, the big percussion, the heavy-hitting instruments, the momentum that would be the perfect representation of Batman. Combine it with plenty of solid light motifs and you've got yourself a dark and thrilling score that helps give momentum to the entire movie. Now, this third act is also the act of the movie where we explore Gotham to its fullest. While we saw certain corners earlier, this is where we expand to see as much of the city as we can. In a direct contrast to the Burton movies and especially the Schumacher movies of old, the Gotham here is entirely designed to look and feel like it's a real place. A lot of this is accomplished with location filming in Chicago, with Batman standing on plenty of the city's towers, all of which is used to continue to ground this world and make it feel like this is any U.S. city. But of course, there are heightened aspects to the city as well. Plenty of the street-level stuff was filmed on impeccably designed sets, allowing there to be tons of little nooks and crannies and little bits here and there to give Gotham a more gothic look. And of course, the most fantastical place in the city is the Narrows, an island filled with worn-down houses, seemingly constant rain, as well as a consistent orange hue, to give it this warm kind of aesthetic. But also housed here on this island is Arkham Asylum, which is where we're introduced to this act's main antagonist, Dr. Jonathan Crane, played excellently by Killian Murphy. This guy is able to imbue this immensely cold, almost sociopathic performance to every scene, even before the big reveal that he is, in fact, the Scarecrow. Every scene of him works extraordinarily well, and it's a great thing that Christopher Nolan saw fit to keep Killian Murphy around after his initial screen test, because while he might not have been right for Batman, he was great for Scarecrow. Would you like to see my mask? I use it in my experiments. I'm probably not very frightening to a guy like you with these crazies. I can't stand it. But Scarecrow is also here to show that despite the city of Gotham feeling immediate change as a result of the arrival of the Batman, there are still big obstacles in Batman's way. And this obstacle in particular has weaponized fear, which continues to center the entire movie's thematic notion around fear. The criminals of Gotham use fear to get what they want without any consequences, Batman subsequently uses fear to give them said consequences, and now Scarecrow uses fear to take down Batman. Man. And so, Batman must once again overcome this fear in order to take Scarecrow down. Why do we fall? Which leads to this pretty gnarly image of Batman using Crane's fear toxin against Crane himself, giving just this horrifying image of what other people must think Batman looks like, or at least their worst nightmare of what Batman looks like. Who are you working for? And that ultimately leads into what is perhaps the best sequence in the entire movie. Batman has found Crane, he's discovered his hiding place, and he's also discovered that Rachel has been hit with the fear toxin. Which means he and Gordon must work together to get Rachel out in time to give her the antidote. 
and the next five minutes are just pure blockbuster gold. This is where the movie reaches perhaps its most bombastic and purely awesome moment, where Batman is driving through the city causing property damage left and right, all the while trying to evade the Gotham PD. The tumbler is jumping across rooftops, it's sliding across roads, diving into underground tunnels. Any trick you can think of, this thing does it. There's even a moment where all of its lights turn off and it seamlessly fades into the darkness. What? There he is! But it's not just about the spectacle, although that is a big part of it. It's that there's also a ticking clock over the entire thing. Batman needs to get Rachel the antidote quickly or else she'll die. So he has to rush through the police cars without observing the rules of the road and get Rachel to safety as fast as humanly possible. Which all leads to the final moment of the sequence, the final punchline on the whole shebang. The Batmobile jumping through the waterfall into the Batcave. And it's a moment that is very deliberately all practical practical, because Christopher Nolan held on to the belief while making this movie that you can do as many fantastical things throughout the sequence so long as the ultimate final punchline is entirely real. And so the tumbler jumping through the waterfall was a real stunt. It was done at full size with every aspect filmed in camera, and it turned out fantastically. And with that climax to Act 3, we are able to move swiftly on to Act 4, the finale. This is where everything comes full circle. In the most obvious sense, that manifests with the reveal of the fourth act's main antagonist, Ra's al Ghul. But wait, didn't Ra's al Ghul die? But is Ra's al Ghul immortal? While it is true that the man Bruce thought was Ra's al Ghul died in the first act, the true Ra's was right in front of him the entire time. What cheap parlor tricks to conceal your true identity, Ra's. Here it's revealed that Crane was working for Ra's the entire time, and that his fear toxin has been laced into Gotham's water mains for weeks. Also that Ra's can activate it and trigger a chain event that will see Gotham tear itself apart through fear. How's he gonna activate it, you ask? Well, he's gonna use a Wayne Enterprises microwave emitter to vaporize all of the water in the mains, thus turning the toxin into a gas, allowing people to inhale it to feel its full effects. And there are a handful of logic issues with the whole microwave emitter thing. For one thing, the toxin had been laid into the water supply for weeks, and it's said that it can only take on its effect if it's inhaled through the lungs. But if anyone were to run hot water, you know, to have a shower, clean dishes, boil some pasta, they'd create some steam and boom, that toxin is activated. Not to mention humans are 70% water, and I don't see this microwave emitter turning human beings into that one guy from Robocop. Not to mention when the emitter is first introduced, it's on a cargo ship over the ocean, and none of the surrounding water gets vaporized? Now, it is fun to point out some of these logical fallacies, but honestly, none of that actually matters, because it's all a vehicle for this massive and bombastic finale. One that sees every single setup from across the rest of the movie paid off. You might not have known it until now, but the movie had been playing an intricate game of dominoes, and for the first three acts, it was simply laying the pieces in place. And now, during this finale, it's finally time to knock them all down. Which all begins with Ra's al Ghul burning down Wayne Manor, creating the crisis point for our hero. Bruce is defeated, the house is gone, he's injured, and he thinks that Gotham is going to fall to the mercy of this madman. That is, until Alfred says, Why do we fall, sir? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up. Just have given up on me. Never. It centralizes Bruce Wayne's entire arc throughout the movie. It pays off two moments from earlier. It sends Bruce back into the action as Batman to stop Ra's al Ghul once and for all. But it's not the only thing. Because everything, and I mean everything, is paid off here. So many lines from across the movie, so many moments come together here, and plenty of satisfying payoffs. This is where the entire story comes together. Where every element comes full circle. It's not who I am underneath. But what I do, it defines me. It even has a fun payoff with Gordon, because earlier upon seeing the tumbler for the first time, he says, I gotta get me one of those. And now, during the finale, while Batman is chasing Ra's al Ghul, Gordon takes the tumbler for a spin to reach Wayne Tower first. 
all of which leads to a final confrontation between Batman and Ra's al Ghul. The mentor that trained him at the start has now become his ultimate foe. There are exciting moments, some crazy visuals with the fear toxin going around, along with a great mixture of miniatures, practical effects, and seemingly invisible visual effects. On top of all of that, the scene is punched up by a ticking clock, as the microwave emitter is fast approaching Wayne Tower, which sits atop the central water main. Batman's gotta stop Roz before the emitter can reach the tower and blow the mains across the entire city. It's fast, it's exciting, it looks great, all of the main characters get something to do, and with payoffs to plenty of the moments preceding it, it all comes together for a deeply thrilling finale that sees Batman ultimately defeat Roz once and for all. With Gordon in position, the train tracks in front of Batman and Roz are destroyed, leaving the train with nothing to do but careen off the tracks and crash into the building below. I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you. There's a bit of a gray area there, Batman, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I'm no expert, but wouldn't leaving Roz to die technically count as killing him? Hmm. Regardless, Roz, trapped on the train, winds up crashing into the building below, exploding with the microwave emitter. And with that, the city of Gotham has been saved. Batman has prevented its total destruction, and now we head into our resolution. And if you thought the payoffs were over now that the action is done, boy, you are sorely mistaken. We still got some heavy hitters, like didn't you get the memo as Lucius Fox takes over Wayne Enterprises? It's all a bit technical, but the point is my company's future is secure. That's another good one. And then, of course, Bruce promises to rebuild Wayne Manor brick by brick, completing his character journey through the story, as he's now become a very different person from who he was at the beginning. And it all closes out with one final scene with Batman and Lieutenant Gordon. The guy got a promotion. That's neat. And together, they discuss the possibility of escalation into the future, which leads right into a tease for Batman's most iconic villain. I'll look into it. After this entire two-hour adventure, that tease is super exciting. Christopher Nolan, Christian Bale, and the entire team managed to bring about a greatly successful film with tons of moving pieces that all work together to create something immensely enjoyable. And now at the very end, they're teasing the Joker? Oh boy, I'm excited for what they might do with that. Batman has begun, and I'm ready to follow him into the future. And that's the whole movie. Man, what a ride. Critics and audiences were blown away by Batman Begins. Reviews coming out of the movie were absolutely stellar, with 5 star ratings, 10 out of 10 scores, and a glowing review from Roger Ebert. The tone, the sensibilities, the unique take on the genre, it all hit a massive home run with critics and audiences. The bad taste of Batman and Robin had completely been forgotten. Christopher Nolan had successfully revived Batman on the big screen, and audiences were more excited than they had been in a long time for his future. At least, the audiences that saw the movie. Because despite the rave reviews across the board, the movie wasn't a runaway success. The stench of Batman and Robin still had an impact on the movie's box office. As ultimately, Batman Begins managed to rake together $206 million domestically and $373 million worldwide. Now, that's nothing to sneeze at. But with a $150 million production budget, it wasn't quite the success that ensured a sequel would happen without question. While there were certainly some fans who began to await what they believed was an inevitable sequel, there were others who began to quietly mourn. Mourn for a franchise that might never be, despite a really strong start. Even Christopher Nolan, despite putting in that Joker tease, wasn't sure if he was ever going to return to make a second Batman movie. Up to this point, he'd never made a sequel at all, nor was he in entirely sure where to take the story after Batman Begins, which left fans of Batman Begins in limbo, as they were only able to ask themselves two crucial questions. Will Christopher Nolan continue his Batman story? Will Batman Begins get a sequel? Honestly, it might be a safe bet to say that if the fear toxin was unleashed on Batman fans, it would show them a world without a sequel to Batman Begins. Now isn't that a scary thought? But fans would still be able to relish in this new take on the Caped Crusader, and despite the questions heading into the future, there were plenty of fans who now felt that they had just gotten their definitive take on Batman on the big screen. I never said thank you. 
and you'll never have to. Which meant that the only thing fans could do now was cross their fingers and hope for the best for his future. 